Good morning. Welcome to Bellevue. It's so exciting to see you here this morning, and I hope that you're prepared to worship the Lord today. Are you? Yeah, there we go. Uh, If you're tuning in online, we want to welcome you as well. We're so glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us today, take a moment and uh, you can take your phone and scan the QR code that's in in front of you, and uh, that'll pull up the guest card, or you can text BELLGUEST to 94,000 and fill out the guest card that way. And again, we're so excited that you're here. And after the service, uh, when you head out those doors, you'll see a blue uh, table and a volunteer will be there. They would like to give you a gift, a free gift, just to say thank you for being with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we will worship together. Father God, we praise you and we worship you. How wonderful it is to be in your house today. Father, we pray that as we gather, you will prepare our hearts, you'll prepare our minds uh, to hear from you today. You'll speak to us, you will encourage us, Father, and also let us be an encouragement to one another. What a blessing it is to be here today, Father. Let us hear from you. Now, Father, hear our voices, hear our hearts as we sing praises to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And the people said, hallelujah. Go ahead and have a seat. And it's my distinct privilege to direct your attention towards the baptistry. It is my distinct privilege today to welcome into the waters of baptism, Della Harris. Della? Two more steps. <laughs> All right. Della, are you trusting in Jesus and in Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Well, then, Della, upon your profession of faith, in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> there you go. Proud of you. All right. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you so very much for the faith that you gave Della to receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Thank you, dear God, that um, she has entered into that relationship with Christ. And Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon her as she grows in her relationship with you day in and day out for the rest of her days. And Father God, may we, as a community of faith, dear Lord, encourage her and equip her for that walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for the privilege of being able to witness uh, her baptism today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Continue our time in worship this morning through the hearing of God's word. And Paul writes in his letter to the Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The word of the Lord. Would you stand as we continue to respond to the Savior, the cross of which he suffered for our great gain? Jesus, keep me near the cross, near a precious fire.
child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Praise the Lord. You may be seated. We want to do one more song for you today because we want you guys to be able to enjoy and remember the blessings of God and what he has done for you. We've been traveling through the book of Daniel um, with Pastor Greg and others, and this is just a, an opportunity for us, just like the Israelites had to intentionally remember who God was in a time where they were away from their home and making new homes and living in the promise that was to come, we can do the same thing. We can remember now and also live now in the promises of God.
have a seat. If you came this morning prepared to, to give your tithes and offerings, uh, we thank you for your continued faithfulness to the Lord. And uh, you can do that in several ways. First of all, we have boxes at the doors and on the way out. You can drop your check in there. Or if you'd like to give electronically, you can give through our app or our website. Uh, or you can mail a check into the church or drop it off during the week during regular office hours. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and thank Him for His provision. Oh, Lord God, we do remember all of the many times that you have, have come through, Father. Whether it's uh, at a time of need, at a time of brokenness, at a time of pain, or a time of, of just being overwhelmed and flooded by your love and your mercy and your grace through forgiveness. Oh, Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for in spite of our brokenness and our wandering, you are always faithful. We praise you and we worship you. Lord God, I thank you so much for uh, the tithes and the offerings that are being given this morning. We pray, Father, that you will use those to bring glory and honor to your name and to build your kingdom. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. I hope you're ready to study God's Word today. If you take your Bibles out and turn to the book of Daniel, there in your Old Testament, chapter 7 through chapter 12. And uh, we, are, we are concluding our series in the book of Daniel today. And uh, as you're looking for those scriptures, let me just say a word about something else that's going to be happening uh, later today. I want to invite uh, any of our members back that would be willing to come back at uh, 4 o'clock today right here in the sanctuary. We're having an ordination service for two uh, deacons, uh, Jake Dietz and John Janes. And uh, they are going to be ordained as uh, new deacons here at our church this afternoon. And so really want to invite the entire congregation to be a part of that and uh, to witness that. So I uh, hope that many of you will take me up on that invitation. Uh, we are in the concluding message of this series, Stand Out. We've been studying the book of Daniel now for seven weekends, and uh, we have been diving deep into learning how to stand out for, for Christ in a world that wants to assimilate us away from Christ. And we have talked about having to stand with courage and faith. We have taught, uh, for, we have learned from the scriptures that we are to live rightly and love kindly. And it has been a powerful, powerful journey uh, of inspiration. I know I have been inspired just by studying this pas these passages and bringing messages to you. And, and uh, I hope that you have been edified as well. And today, today we're going to take a look at the last six chapters. You're not going to be here any longer than you usually are, but we're going to look at the last six chapters of the book of Daniel. You know, the Israelites, they had been displaced from their homeland, their way of life, everything they had uh, held dear was rattled. And you know what, in our day, our uh, we see many of the foundations of things that we have held dear uh, uh, rattled and shaken as well. And we, like the Israelites, can wonder, is God in control? Uh, will he watch over his own? Does he have a plan? You know, the Hebrews wondered that, and they were going through far more than we go through. And God used Daniel to give them prophetic assurance that God was indeed in control, that God is the author of the story. And that's really the message for us today, is that God is the author of the story. And because of that, we can know that we can stand out for him in the midst of the crucible moments of life in the here and now. You know, it's interesting, 
<coughs> excuse me, the book of Daniel is 12 chapters long. Half of the book of Daniel, the first six chapters, are narrative in nature. They tell the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the Israelites in the midst of, of, the, uh, of the decades of exile, the suffering that they went through, the pressure that they were under, the, the persecution that they experienced, the times where they had to stand out and had to be willing to pay a high price to do it. And we see them in this pressure cooker of culture uh, having to, to stand and discover their God in the midst of those moments. And it's a, it, it's a powerful story, those first six chapters. But the, the second s- six chapters are prophetic, apocalyptic visions that God had given, had given Daniel to give to the people so that those people might be encouraged to know that whatever pressure they're under today, that God has today, yesterday, and tomorrow under his control. And you know what? We needed this message of Daniel in this season of our lives because we too need to know that God is the author of the story. And so I want you to be encouraged. I want to be encouraged by that fact For we so often can feel so lost in the midst of the circumstances of our lives. And it's in those moments that we deeply need to know that God is the author. You know, it's interesting, the six six chapters that we're going to survey here this morning, and that's all we'll be able to do, those six chapters are essentially a collection of the visions that God gave Daniel during the story of the first six chapters. So you can actually look at this chapter over here and coordinate it with what was happening in the narrative chapter over here. And what you see is that God was speaking to the people through Daniel at times of great crucible moments, that God was speaking to them through these visions in order to say, hey, I know that right now seems overwhelming, but be comforted. I have control of now and tomorrow and the many tomorrows to come, and even we, I I will wrap this all up to a great triumphant conclusion. And so in those moments, they got that word. And Daniel serves as that word for us even now. Now I want to give you just a, a, a quick overview of these six chapters, and we'll read some passages of that. You might want to open up to chapter 7 first and take a look at there, but these six chapters, 7 through 12, they are visions of Daniel, and these chapters describe Daniel's apocalyptic visions, which which reassure God's people that in spite of exile, in spite of persecution, God is still in control of history and will see his purposes through. And then we see in chapter 7, First, we see a great vision of four beasts. So let's go ahead and read those first eight verses of chapter seven. There's so much. Let me just say, there is so much in these six chapters that I, it's so much detail, so much meaning, so so many uh, truths uh, to glean, and, and we will only kind of scratch the surface just a little. I want us to see the broad brush strokes today. It would be a whole other 12-part series just to go through the the, the next six chapters, and we're going to deal with them in just a matter of minutes. But we're going to glean fundamental truths that you can apply to your lives in these precious moments. We see in verse 1 of chapter 7, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay, uh, lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night and beheld the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. 
And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up a, um, among them another horn, a little one, be, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And we see this terrifying vision of these four beasts. And we ask ourselves, what does this mean? Now, now we, we could read the rest of the chapter, and, and God gives the, uh, the interpretation of that. I'm going to give you just a quick survey. Most interpreters see, uh, both by interpreting the rest of the chapter, as well as interpreting history and seeing how these prophecies were fulfilled, see that the visions of these four beasts are visions of four different kingdoms or four different empires, cultural empires. And most interpreters see that the lion in verse 4 represents Babylon, which which is spoken of, that great empire, in in this book of Daniel. And and we see in verse 4 that the, the, the winged being is plucked which represents the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar, which we studied just a few weeks ago. And so we see that Babylon comes and it goes. Then comes, replacing Babylon as a great empire, the bear, verse 5, which represents the Medo-Persian empire, which we also see fleshed out in the midst of the days of Daniel. And then we see that the empire that comes and, and takes that by a storm is the leopard in verse 6. And most interpreters uh, come to take a look and see that, that this fits very neatly into the history of Alexander the Great that would have come a couple hundred years after this prophecy was made. Alexander the Great and his rapid conquest of the civilized world is represented in this prophecy. And the four heads represented the division of the kingdom into four parts after Alexander's death. So we see that this prophecy was spoken a couple hundred years before, and then it was fulfilled in history. But then Alexander's empire is replaced by this fourth empire, which we read about in verses 7 and 8. This final terrifying beast represents, most interpreters believe, the Roman Empire. And so we see this, this, this prophetic view into the future of kingdom after kingdom, authority after authority, cultural dominant uh, uh, over cultural dominant. One people dominate the world for a while, then another group dominates. So it's, it's history. And it's history for us now, but, but back then it was prophecy. It was coming. And it would happen, and we've seen it happen already, scriptures fulfilled. Then we see in chapter 9, and in chapter 9, chapter 9 c- contains a prayer of Daniel. And Daniel is praying to the Lord, and it is toward the getting closer to the end of the 70 years of exile. And Daniel knows from the prophecies that came from Jeremiah that, uh, that they could expect 70 years in exile away from Jerusalem. But that Jeremiah had told them that they needed to seek the Lord before they would then go and return to Jerusalem and that God would open up the doors and that they would pray and God would answer. And so we see in chapter 9 that's exactly what what um, Daniel does. I want us to take a look at chapter 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by 
descent a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of this reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the numbers, uh, number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. When I turned my face to the Lord, God seeing, seeking him, to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. And so he comes and he confesses the sins of the people. And, and, and he confesses the very sins that had brought them into exile. See, they had rebelled against their God, and because of that, God had uh, allowed their enemies to overcome them and uh, take them into exile so that they would learn that they needed to depend on God. And so here they are. They are toward the end of these 70 years, and, and Daniel is confessing the sins of the people, and he's, he's asking for forgiveness and grace we skip down to verse 19. He says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And then we see God sends the angel, angel Gabriel in verse 20 and says, when I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of, of my people Israel and presenting my pleas before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, when I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And then he gave him a word that basically said, your prayer has been answered. Your prayer has been answered. And the next phase of prophetic utterance is going to come and become manifest for your people. And then we see chapter 10 through 12. And here we see Daniel's vision of final conflicts. The conflict on earth that happens over and over again. There are, as Jesus says, wars and rumors of wars throughout history. They reflect also conflict in the spiritual realm. And in these visions, we see that these conflicts will continue throughout history until the end when the Lord will have an ultimate conflict and will be triumphant forever and ever. And so we see these six chapters, and we see these sweeping views of apocalyptic vision. What does all this mean? What does this tell us today? What lessons can we draw from this? Well, you can know from this that God is the author of the story. That God's the author of the story. We can believe that God's the author of the story. When you know God is the author of the story, there's several things that you can know. First of all, you can know, number one, that the story is so much bigger than your story. That the story, the story of all that there is, is so much bigger. You know, a reader of these six prophetically jam-packed chapters of Daniel is quickly overwhelmed by the vast prophetic forward view of history involving a multitude of generations as well as a continuous succession of major historic epochs. We find ourselves, you and I, in our lives, we find ourselves lost in what we think is a long life. We're usually, all we think of is the arena of our own existence and our own living and our own being. And we think of our life, particularly after we've lived for a while, but even when we're young, we think of it as long. Within our own generation, you know, when I think back to the 90s or I think back to the 80s or I think back to the 70s, I was born in the 60s, but I don't think back on that that much. It was only the last two years of that decade. But, but all the other decades, I have reference points. I can remember. I, I think about how different each of those, uh, of the, uh, uh, how different the world was 50 years ago or 40 years ago. And, and I, I go, wow, I've lived a long time. Wow, it's been, there's been so much water under the bridge. I think that this, I think of it, this as a, my lifespan is a long stretch of time. But God's story 
is so much bigger than my story of a handful of decades. I mean, just take a look at what's represented in Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream. So there's this first year of, king, the, uh, of Belshazzar, the, the king of Babylon. And then you take a look at uh, verse 17 of chapter uh, uh, 7. And it says, these four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. Can you imagine how long that will take? These four, uh, these four kings represented hundreds and hundreds of years, almost a thousand years. Years of, of active and a recognized dominion in the world. And then we see here in verse 23 and 24 uh, the, the, of chapter 7, it says, as for the ten horns, we're talking about that final beast and the Roman Empire, out of this kingdom shall ten kings shall arise. And so even the Roman government, as it is uh, d d dissolved around the fourth century and begins to fall apart, why then ten kings arise out of that? That, that there's even more uh, uh, um, dominions and governments and and another shall rise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings, and he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times of the law, and they shall be given into his hands for a time, and times, and half a time. And we just see this endless story, seemingly endless story. And if we think of our own story, and fold it in that story, our story becomes really, really, really small. God is in charge of this vast story of life. We see in eight, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So there's, you know, continuation of that reign. We see verse 1 of chapter 9, in the first year of Darius. And now we have a whole other empire that's, that, that is in play. Even in Daniel's lifetime, we see in chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Here, a whole other cultural empire, still even in the lifetime of Daniel. And then chapter 11, Verse 1, and as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, you know, another king. God's overarching story is so vast and so beyond our own that when we look at Daniel's vision of God, God authoring vast, complex, and diverse periods of history involving millions of people over time, we can begin to think that our story is inconsequential. And that it is therefore by default inconsequential to God. But that would not be true. For as God is intimately acquainted with all aspects of the sweeping brushstrokes of history, so he is intricately and intimately and totally engaged in the smallest portions of that history which include your story. You see, the second thing is that when you know God is the author of the story, you know that your story is a part of God's bigger story. Your story is a part of God's bigger story. You know, so many times because we just see from our very limited view of the span of our own lives, we think about uh, the difficulties of, in our own world, and we go, oh Lord, when are you going to wrap up history triumphantly? When are you going to make this thing better? When are you going to make these things right? We see injustices in the world, and we go, God, when are you going to fix that problem? When are you going to deal with that thing? And we can begin to think that maybe God has forgotten us, or maybe God isn't even God at all. And, and we, we can begin to think, well, maybe my story just doesn't warrant the attention of God. Maybe my story, maybe he's just, I'm not important enough. And yet, God cares for us so deeply. Why we see in uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, verse 8 and 9, it says, But do you do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. We need to gain God's perspective and realize that God is watching over all of history, and God is also watching over our history. And that he is not 
ever forgotten us. Why well, he says in verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's actually delaying some of those things that you are praying for because he is doing a spiritual work of repentance and faith in your life. He is not delaying in order to forget you. He has not forgotten you and therefore he has delayed in order to minister to you and to call you to himself. See, we need to understand that we are but a mist. We are but a small part of his greater story. In James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15, the Bible says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. You see, we need to understand that, that our life is but a mist in the midst of it. We're just a small part. But as we are a small part, we're a part that God intimately cares about. And he does. He intimately cares about us. We see this in Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus knows that his people are anxious and worried that God won't take care of them. And he says in verses 25 and 26 of Matthew 6, Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. He's saying, listen, you, you, you're afraid that God isn't gonna take care of you. God's taking care of these sweeping brushstrokes of history. But you're afraid that you're too small and that he's not going to regard you. But then he says here, he says, look at the birds of the air, whom you even think are even more inconsequential than you in your life. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, more, uh, not of more value than they? In other words, if God is taking care of the Sparrow, he is going to take care of you. And you can know that. You can know that his eye is on the sparrow and you know he's watching you too. He is. He is. And then third, when you know God is the author of the story, you know God is sovereign over the story and thus over your story. We see in Daniel chapter 4, you go back a little ways into the narrative portions of Daniel, you look at Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 through, through uh, 35, and you see something that Nebuchadnezzar says after God has humbled him and, and brought him to his knees, and he says in, in verse uh, 34 of chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, he says this, he says, for his dominion, God's dominion that is, is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth and none sh can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? In Psalm 97, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. You see, God's prophetic insight imparted to Daniel displayed that God is the author of the entire story of all that has been. He is not only the author, but the ever-present authority, the sovereign, the king of every scenario of the story. Think about it just for a moment. Scientists know that Light travels at the speed of 5.87 trillion miles a year. They also know that, he, that uh, the galaxy of which our solar system is a part is about 100,000 light years in diameter and about 587,000 trillion miles. It is one of about a million such galaxies in the optical range of our most powerful telescopes. It has been estimated that in our galaxy there are more than two 
hundred billion stars. The sun is one of them. A modest star burning at about 6,000 degrees centigrade on the surface and traveling in an orbit of 135 miles per second, which means it will take about 250 million years to complete a revolution around the galaxy. And this is only the stretch of creation that we can see or contemplate. What might be beyond, be beyond that? And God is the author of that story and undoubtedly so much more. In all of its vastness, in all of its seemingly endless domain, Isaiah 40 says this, To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these stars. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Who is exalted among the heavens, is what the scripture is saying. Who is the transcendent author of the story? The scripture tells us in Psalm 57 verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. You see, in your story and my story is tucked into this vast and greater story. Our story is not lost in the vastness of this story. No, better yet, it is an integral, God-ordained chapter in that divinely told story. God's not just watching over you. He's not just speaking over your story. He's more than telling that story. He's writing the dynamics of that story at every turn on every page. And because of this, you can know that you're not forgotten nor abandoned. This is something the Israelites desperately needed to know as they spent generations of lives separated from the life that they had known. They had felt like the world that they knew and loved had been ripped off around them and they were left alone and in despair. And God says, no, I'm the author of the story, you're the apple of my eye, you're at the center of my story, and you have not been left behind, you're a part of what I'm doing. And this is something you and I need to know as well. And the fourth thing that we need to understand is that when you know God is the author of the story, you know that you're accountable to the author of the story. When you're a character he wrote into the story, You're beholden to the author of the story. And though he has given you free agency, and though he has given you free will, you're ultimately accountable to the author of this story. The Israelites would have known this through the teaching and the preaching and the prophetic words that God had Daniel speak. You see, you're accountable to the author of the story, which means judgment is inevitable. Judgment is inevitable. You know, Hebrews chapter, chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 27, says it pretty clear. It says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. All of us someday are going to breathe our last if the Lord should tarry, and then we're going to stand before God with an accounting of our lives. Did we trust in him for salvation? Did we live for him with our heart? Judgment is inevitable. We live in a world that wants to separate their thought from that inevitable judgment, but judgment is inevitable. But not only, and we see this also in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, the very first three verses, it says, At that time shall rise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been seen there was, uh, since there was a nation as never, as never as there was seen, I'm sorry, such as never has been seen there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. We see here judgment is inevitable. 
But not only is judgment inevitable, the great good news that we see in Daniel, and particularly in Daniel chapter 9, is that repentance is available. Not only is judgment inevitable, repentance is available. What did it say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 that we read earlier? It says that God is being patient with us. He is not wrapping up human history just yet because He's patient with us. He wants all of us to have an opportunity to repent and turn to Him and receive His grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Well, we see in Daniel chapter, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, and we read part of that earlier, Daniel is praying, repenting for his people, and then we see that he even asks for forgiveness and grace. And the Bible says, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved, therefore consider the word and understand the vision. Mercy and grace and forgiveness was given. You see, we live in a day of salvation that is so glorious where we can give our lives to Christ. We can come to him with our broken, sin-sick lives and ask for his forgiveness and grace, and he grants it on the basis of the fact that his son paid for our sins on the cross. His sinless son died on the cross for our sins, and so we can be raised to newness of life with our sins forgiven, with life in our souls for all eternity. What a grace gift. What a glorious gift. God has done this for us. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, when it says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You're accountable to the author of the story. Judgment is inevitable. But repentance is available. You can come back to him. You can come to him. You can have your sins forgiven. You can rightly align with the author of life and not be left in the dust of history, but rather caught up in the glories of his salvation. And number five, when we come to know that God is the author of the story then we know in our story evil will seem to have its day, but ultimately God reigns and has the last say. We see this in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 21. In the first five verses which says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Our God, our God is going to have that final triumph. And you may be going through, and inevitably all of us will go through times where it seems as if evil is winning. But ultimately God reigns, and he will have the last say. So I don't know about you, but you may be somebody that has felt the pressure of the culture while you're standing for Christ. Or you might be just overwhelmed by the circumstances of life that seem to make trust in God difficult in your life. But today you can know that God is the author of the story. And your small story in that story is not small to God. It is as important to God as the whole story. And his eye is watching you. And his pen is writing the circumstances of your life. And he is writing the chapters and the pages and the the volumes of your life story in a way that leads you more and more to him. And so, my friend, 
rest in the comfort of his story. Maybe you say, but I don't have a relationship with him. I've not accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I, I'm, and yet judgment is coming for me. And I say, but repentance is available. Jesus died for you too. And his story can now shape your story if you will repent of your sin and turn to him and embrace him in your life. Maybe you've been rebelling against the author of your story. You may be even somebody that's, you've accepted Jesus, you've walked, but you've been rebelling against the author of your story or against some of the challenges in your story and you've alienated yourself from God. But repentance is there for you too. Just as Daniel prayed on behalf of the Israelites, confess sins and turn back to God so you can this very day. You, you can find yourself back in the hands of God in the story that he's the author of. Would you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Father God, the author of our story, we need you so badly. So often we've rebelled against you in the strokes of your pen. And yet, dear Father God, every word written over our story is a word that's marked by your love for us. Even the most challenging tests that we must travel, traverse through are tests that we experience because you're calling us and drawing us to yourself. Father God, some of us have been anxious and we need to stop being anxious and trust in your sovereignty. Some of us have been rebellious and we need to repent and come back to you. All of us need to rest in the assurance that you have history, past, present, and future in your hands. And that includes our life. And if you can take care of the universe, you can certainly take care of us and the chaos we feel at times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna have a time of public invitation and maybe God has laid it on your heart to make a public decision today. Maybe it's to join the life of Bellevue. Maybe you've been coming here for some time and you say, you know what, I wanna become a member of Bellevue. Well, while we sing here in just a moment, you could step out of your seat and come. Maybe, maybe you say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and request baptism. Why, you could step out of your seat and come forward. There'll be pastors here to pray with you and to lead you in your decision. Maybe God's laid some other decision upon your heart that you want to pray with a pastor over. We're here for you. Let's stand. Let's sing together. You come if the Lord's prompted your heart to make a public decision today.
may be seated. So glad that